Hello, this is John Wecker reporting for Life Science TV, and I'm joined today by Dr. Beverly Torek Storr of the Fred Hutch. Beverly, it's really a pleasure to see you today. It's really a pleasure to be here. And congratulations on your award, Women Thank in Life you. Science. Thank that's you a very phenomenal, much. that's very good. I'm really, really, really happy for you. Um, so, if I remember correctly, your scientific career spans four decades or so? It does. Okay. It does. So can you, I started when I was three. When you were three. <laughs> Very good. Um, so could you tell us just a little bit of how you got into science and talk generally about the body of work that you've done over those many years? I think I got into science because of Sputnik. Oh, wow. Sputnik was uh, the Russian satellite that went into space mm -hmm. and it beat our satellite into space, mm -hmm. which totally freaked out the government. Yes. Because the Russians were ahead. Yes. And so they thought about why that may be and they decided it was because we needed better math and science education. So they did a brilliant thing for once. Mm -hmm. They actually trained teachers. <laughs> and so I had phenomenal science teachers in my early days, mm -hmm. and they turned me on to science. Great. And then from there? From there, I wanted to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I went to the University of Pittsburgh, and I was offered a stipend from the Atomic Energy Commission wow, okay. to study radiation biology. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh was full of people who were doing radiation biology because some of them had been the first people on the ground in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they were doing studies to try to reproduce the dose exposure mm -hmm. that the people had staying there so they could understand the biological effectiveness mm -hmm. of the radiation. And I found that very interesting. And then from there, you got your PhD in radiation biology and genetics, if I remember correctly. Human and genetics. Human genetics. And eventually you migrated out to the Seattle area. I did migrate out to the Seattle area. And I'd like to say it was motivated entirely by science, but it wasn't. No. Oh, OK. I wanted to climb mountains. Hey, all right. And so I came to climb mountains. And I wanted to marry my husband, Reiner Storp, who was in Seattle at the time. Mm -hmm. OK. So I came to Seattle. and. Um, yeah, that's what I did. Okay, and joined the laboratory of Don Thomas, is that correct? Not initially, not initially. Not initially. I initially was at the UW okay. in hematology. Okay. But as I learned of Don and his work and that he was working with stem cells, mm -hmm. because that's what he was transplanting, stem cells, okay. uh, I wanted to join his team. Mm -hmm. So I was an, essentially invited to join his team to understand why marographs failed when they failed. Okay. And that would mean why aren't the stem cells doing their thing? Okay. And what what progressed from there because your 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 interest in stem cells has gone on for years and years. That's it has. Well, the more you learn, the more you learn you don't know. Yeah. yeah. And um, there are so many enigmas about stem cells. I mean, the first thing I learned was that they do not do anything autonomously. Okay. They are instructed by the other cells in the marrow microenvironment. And that was an argument I had with lots of big players mm -hmm. who believed that stem cells had in intrinsic control of their fate. Okay. And I said, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they have extrinsic control of their fate. They're influenced by other cells around them. Mm -hmm. And so now, um, defining those other cells and defining the cell products those other cells make is a huge field yeah. in, in our our work. Yeah. Huge field. So I was right. You were right, of course. And you reminded me of, of a story um, when we were chatting yesterday. And I said, well, I'm going to be asking you about your, your, your proudest achievement or your greatest achievement over the years. You had a particular turn of phrase. And I wonder if you'd share that story with the audience. I'm reluctant, but I will. Okay, please. <laughs> I've been mo motivated mostly to prove the bastards wrong. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so. And as an example. Not everybody that I've proven wrong has been of such a Deserves such a title. Okay. But there are a few. There, there are, are a few. few. And, and it's most gratifying to um, prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, prove them wrong. So one thing that it took maybe 10 years to convince the other scientists was that the bone marrow stem cell, which is an adult stem cell, which makes blood, mm -hmm. um, only makes blood products. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, people wanted to believe that it could make any cell in the body. Mm -hmm. And they wished it to be true. Yes. Because it would have been very convenient. We never would have had to go to embryonic stem cells mm -hmm. if we turned that cell into anything we wanted. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a long time establishing that fact. So I wonder if you'd tell us a little, more, a little more about Don Thomas and what was he like as a mentor and, and what did he mean to you? And, and I know you've 
very fond of Dottie as well. So if you'd like to share something about Dottie, that would be Don nice. was incredibly tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, the call you dreaded was the call from Dottie saying, Beverly, Don would like to see you in his office. Oh. <laughs> you went down there with dread and you walked in and said, whatever it is, I didn't do. <laughs> I didn't do it, really didn't do it. But he was very tough, mm -hmm. but he was tough on himself, so it was okay. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed working for somebody who had such high standards. Mm -hmm. He um, worked hard. Mm -hmm. There was nothing beneath him. Mm -hmm. He would pick up scrap on the floor if there was some scrap on the floor to pick up. Mm -hmm. Everybody working with that at the Hutch at that time felt that they belonged to something bigger than themselves, mm -hmm. from the lowest to the highest. Yeah. And um, you need that esprit de corps mm -hmm. if you're going to grow like they grew and become what they became. Mm -hmm. And so it was wonderful to work with mm -hmm. for, for Don. And he let you know when you disappointed. Uh -huh. He would definitely But let did you he know. give you reward, a pat on the back when you did something well? Not so much. It's yeah. expected. It was expected. It's expected. So he was a, he was a, he was a, a big man, a big man in many, many ways. And yes, yet you tell was. a story that he also was a man of, of scientific humility. He uh, was in very that he, he, underst yeah, he understood that science progresses. New research is built on old research. And new research sometimes says that the old research wasn't quite right. And That's we right. know that many scientists can't always accept that their previous work was not right. But Don, Don had that humility, didn't he? He did have that humility. Particularly, I have one instance when uh, co colleagues of mine had published in Nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Don as a senior author, that the supporting cells in the marrow microenvironment were from the donor. Mm -hmm. That's another thing the stem cell made. And their data was accurate insofar as what they could do technologically. It was limited at that time. Two years later, I did another study asking the same question, and I had new technology. I had in situ hybridization mm -hmm. where I could show that there were stromal cells in the cultures. But because I could probe them individually, mm -hmm. I knew that they were host in origin. Mm -hmm. Didn't come from the, from the donor. So I published the paper in Nature. Mm -hmm. And Don's name was on that paper too. Yeah. But he called me in and asked to please explain to him how that could be. What, what, how could I explain the difference in our data? So I did. Yeah. And he accepted it. And he put his name on my paper as well. <laughs> to, thereby correcting his previous work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's another story, and, and this has more about the, 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 the progress and the changes that you've seen over the decades of your, your oh, career. Yeah. And um, you tell a story about Don and a horse. <laughs> Can you tell that story to the audience? Well, in the beginning of transplantation, they knew they had to immune suppress the patient after the donor cells came in, because mm -hmm. the donor cells are going to cause graft versus host disease, mm -hmm. which is fatal. And they were making anti-thymocyte globulin in horses. Mm -hmm. So they would receive thymocytes from cardiac surgeries, from uh, pediatric cardiac surgeries from the children's hospital. Mm -hmm. And they would put them in suspension. Then they'd drive to this farm on the east side and inject them into a horse to make horse ATG. Mm -hmm. Well, the horse recognized the syringe <laughs> and recognized Don and my husband <laughs> who was with him and would see them coming would take off. <laughs> And Don would say, not to worry, I'm from Texas, I can lasso him. <laughs> Which, of course, he couldn't he do. He couldn't do it all. <laughs> but it was a good chase. All right. Well, um, one last question, because I know you, you, you have a, another passion, and you're very much, and I think now that I understand, probably inspired by how you started, taking children, underprivileged children, and giving them a, a, an appreciation and exposure to the STEM, especially science, mm -hmm. and really cultivate in them the passion and love that you have. So tell us about that, please. Well, this is a program that I'm really fortunate I'm at the Hutch because they're supporting me in doing this. They've given me a training lab. They've given me an education specialist. And what we do is we bring in students who are uh, underrepresented minorities, mm -hmm. either because they're geographically isolated or they're from minority uh, ethnicity or something like that and are their first generation Americans mm -hmm. and they don't have the support structure mm -hmm. that would allow them to do what they need to do to get into college and stay in college. So we bring them into the science center and we work with them for eight weeks, 40 hours a week. Wow. And we put them in labs with really good faculty mm -hmm. and they learn. Mm -hmm. They not only learn content, they learn that they are capable and they learn that we care about them. And so we provide them with, with a structure that they need. Mm -hmm. And it's working. These kids are going to college. They're wow. getting full rides to college. Good. They come back. And it's, um, it's a, a source of joy. Yes, I can see that.
Well, Beverly, it was an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.